not a con. Okay, so my name is Melinda Minch. I'm getting my master's degree at Case. I'm in the software engineering lab. My specialty is software testing and reliability, and I need to not walk in front of the projector. Um, so what we do in my lab is software testing research. We do software security research. We do some kind of IDS stuff, and I'm mostly on the software testing side. So this talk, the idea for this talk came because I've been going around job interviews, I've been doing some internships, and I've been seeing and getting an idea of what different companies are using for their test infrastructures. And I've been seeing that though these infrastructures are not very similar across the board, some places have very formal structures for testing, some places have almost no structure at all, it's very ad hoc, but a lot of them have common goals for improving what they're doing. And one of the common goals that I've seen in my latest experience has been automation, or more extensive automation. Places want to automate their tests further, or they want to automate them at all. So this made me wonder, what's next? What's the big buzzword that we're going to see in maybe three or five years for software testing? And so I'm here to make some conjectures about that. So before I get started, I should warn you, I'm not a psychic. I'm the most familiar with my own research, so I may not be representing the entire body of cool software testing research that's going on. Also, I do have limited industry experience because I've been stuck in my ivory tower for God knows how long. So these are the grains of salt that you should take from this talk. All right. So before I get started with the meat of the talk, I should say, if you have any questions or comments or anything, just raise your hand, etc. I don't want to be like talking for the whole hour or however long I've got to talk. If you want to jump in with anything, go right ahead. So I'm going to talk about four main topics for this talk. I'm going to talk about profiling. I'm going to talk about operational testing. There's going to be some test selection and prioritization and a few little domain specific techniques. So here we go. So when you test software, one thing that you want to look at is what's going on inside the software. You see it running, and it's sort of a, a bit of a black box, right? And you can look at the code and see, you know, what's the, what this code is supposed to be doing. But you don't know exactly what's going on. And profiling is a way to sort of look inside the black box and see what's going on while the software is running. And there are a lot of profiling tools available for testing right now. There's sort of performance profiling and tools that profile memory usage, like Rational Quantify, like Bounds Checker, which checks for buffer overflows and stuff like that. So while your program under test is running, they take a look at it. They see how much memory is getting used by what functions and where. There's also some test code coverage profilers, like Clover. So they take a look at your software while it's being tested, and they say, OK, so all of your tests covered X percentage of your code. What current research wants to do is step this up a little bit. And one way to do that is to look at the flow of information in your program. So when I've got a data flow profile, I want to see what happens between the time a variable or some other piece of data is defined or initialized and when it's used. So let's take a look at my little example here. I've got a user somewhere putting confidential data, maybe it's medical records or something, into a web interface that my company's written. And I want this web interface to end up at some kind of data processor. You know, this data's going to go through there, and it's going to get processed by something that's, of course, secure and all that great stuff. I've made sure it's HIPAA compliant. But in between there, I've used somebody else's input validator just because I want to make sure that nobody's trying any SQL injection attacks or stuff like that. So I'm just taking one and plugging one in. I got it from somewhere on the internet. You know, maybe my friend Bob wrote it. I don't know where it came from. So this confidential data is going to flow through this input validator. Now, I might have all the security in the world here and here, but right here might be vulnerable to exploits. I might have some fields that should be private and aren't. 
I might have some functions that call stuff in here that maybe display something somewhere or can be called by a software that's exploiting this thing. So I have an information leak. And information flow profiling is one way to expose those. Another thing that information flow profiling is good for is taking a look at object-oriented design. So if you have two classes, so I've got class A and class B. Let's say I've got B looking at a bunch of A's information. And I want to say, OK, maybe B depends a little bit too much on A. Or maybe I want to separate this out into another class C. And looking at information flow is one way to take a look at your code and maybe change things around a little bit or refactor. Also, data flow can help you trace the impact of a bug. So if I've got a bug in here, then I know that when this bug rears its ugly head, stuff in here and in here is going to be affected. And maybe not in classes where information doesn't flow from the web interface. There are a couple kinds of data flows that you can look at. So the first kind is explicit. I've got a variable y, and data is flowing from x to y, because I have an assignment from x to y. The value of y depends directly on the value of x. There's also implicit data flow. So the value of y depends indirectly on the value of x here. So if x is greater than 3, y is one value. Otherwise, it's a totally different one. So you might not think of the implicit flows as being an information flow, and a lot of people overlook these, but they're there, and they can be used to gather information. Is this making sense to everybody so far? Yeah? All right, cool. Now on to something completely different. So when you're running a program, your program's probably made up of functions. God help you if it isn't. And um, you want to know whether they're being called, how many times they're being called. And this is, this is good for debugging. You, know, you, you want to know when this thing, when this piece of code is, is being called, when it's being used, and why. So function call profiling can count how many times each function is called during a program execution. And it can also, if you want to save space or time, you can maybe say this function was called or it was not called. So you can either count them or you can just say yes or no. So this can answer some questions. It can answer which functions show up in failed executions. So if you have your program crashing 30 times out of 100, and there is a certain function that always shows up in that crash, and it doesn't show up anywhere else, that's a pretty big hint. You should look there. You can figure out which functions are used the most so that you can optimize them, so that you can make sure that they're really tight, they don't have any bugs in them, concentrate a lot of effort on them. And you can figure out which functions appear together, which can affect your design. So maybe you know that one function always calls another function. So you might just lump them together into one big one for some reason. From function calls, you can go to basic blocks, which is about the same as a function call, except it's more finer grained. So here I have a picture of some code. And a basic block is a piece of code that if the first statement in it is called, you know the last one's called. So let's look at my blue one. For this basic block, I know that if this statement is called, then do different stuff is also called. Because it's in one block. It's in one path of control. So the green one is a block. The blue one's also a block. So if you have a bunch of these, you can look at your code and break it up a little bit more in function call profiling. Maybe you have a lot of really big functions, so this would be more feasible for you to do, and it would be more useful. It also takes more resources, though. Something that's a horse of a different color is operational profiling. And this doesn't really count anything about the software itself as you are using it. It's, it, it counts stuff about the software in the field. So it's collecting data about the environment in which the software is running and about the way that the software is being used. So this is used when you put your software in beta testing or you send it out to a customer or something like that. And you can count 
things like a range of inputs. So if I've got function one and I've got function two, maybe if I want to profile over a range of inputs, I can say, okay, at this customer site, function one, 90% of the time, its arguments are integers between one and 10. And function two, 90% of the time, its arguments are integers between 4,000 and 6,000. You can optimize your code and debug accordingly. There are certain things that you have to watch out for depending on your range of inputs and what people are actually doing with this stuff. You can also collect information about the data types that are being coming into play in your program. So if you wrote your own B tree or something for this software, and it's kind of crappy, and it has a couple memory leaks, maybe it doesn't matter so much if on all the customer sites, only two of them are ever being used at one time. Maybe you can concentrate your debugging efforts elsewhere. But if you have 50 of these crappy B trees going around in memory all at once at all of your customer sites, then you need to tighten your code up a little bit because you're going to have some problems. Finally, operational profiling can collect information about the deployment environment. So let's say that you designed your software to be run under Windows XP with a certain amount of RAM and all that great stuff. And you find out that 90% of your customers are running it under Windows 98 with like a hamster on a wheel, then maybe you should change the way your code's working. So the reason this is, this is research and not used in industry right now is because there are kinks to work out with it. Profiling takes a lot of overhead. You have to write a profiler, first of all, that collects data about all this stuff. Sometimes you have to go through and instrument your code, which means that you insert statements of code inside your functions to count how many times they get called or something like that. And it also generates a ton of data. So if you've got one software execution that takes 10 minutes, you've got 3,000 functions being called or 3,000 function calls in it, and you've got maybe 10,000 functions to look at, you're going to have a lot of stuff to sift through and you're going to have a lot of information to work with. And if you can't handle large amounts of information or if you don't have a process set up to do stuff with that, then you might be in trouble and it might not be very useful. Any questions so far? Yeah. It's... Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's possible to write a high-level wrapper to do something like that. They do. You can use the bytecode engineering library in Java is a good way to do it. You can take a look at the compiled code, the compiled class files, and inject stuff in there. Um, one ideal use of aspect-oriented programming is for profiling. So you can define your cut points at maybe the start of a function call insert code that way, and you're done. But there's still a factor of overhead with the profiler, especially at runtime. So you have the profiler running also, you've got this extra code running also, and that takes time too. But yeah, good question. So that was profiling. And profiling gets used in a lot of places, and it gets used in everything in the rest of my talk. So now we're going on to operational testing. Current operational testing techniques are alpha and beta testing, where companies will eat their own dog food, so to speak, or send it out to a subset of users. Um, another variety of operational testing that you have all have probably seen is the little box that comes up when your Microsoft program crashes. It says, would you like to send information back to Microsoft? And that's a form of operational testing. It sends a mini core dump back to Microsoft and they extract information from it. And another type of operational testing is feedback buttons. In some beta software or some shareware that you see, there's a little button in the corner that says, click this to give us feedback about our software. And you can send them a message. So taking this one step further is observation-based testing. And this is the stuff that my lab does, or one of the things that my lab does. So the crux of observation-based testing is that more information should be 